Hello everybody, it's Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Paul Leonard Morgan. On this episode, we will focus on his musical education, his career as a versatile composer, and of course, his latest score, Tales from the Loop, which he co-scored with Philip Glass. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. I would say thank you for having me, but hi from the other side of the world in lockdown. Still, thank you very much for for joining me today via via Skype. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. And Paul, in 1995, if I'm not mistaken, you had graduated from the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama with a Bachelor of Arts. And given the fact your mother was a music teacher, it comes as no surprise that you pursued a career as a professional musician. And please tell me a bit about your musical studies and how and when you got your first assignments. So you say it comes as no surprise. I mean, mom was always like, don't be a musician. There's no money. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, although she did play on a couple of my soundtracks. She's an amazing flautist, a uh, brilliant flute player. Um, so I'd always wanted to get her to play on one of them. And I remember actually it was a session we had at Angel Studios and I just hired it out for another three hours so that she didn't have to play in front of the rest of the orchestra and we could get her in to come do some overdubs. And it was the most wonderful experience. But um, anyway, that wasn't your question. <laughs> so uh, well, musical education. So, yeah, so I studied at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. Um, I was living in London with my parents and mum Scottish. And there was this wonderful new film music course starting up. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll just go up to Glasgow for three years and see all my aunts and uncles and everything and then head back down to London afterwards. And I just adored everything about Glasgow, loved it. Um, started listening to Bernstein's Pretty Fugum Riffs. I study classical music. I study orchestration. So James McMillan was one of my teachers there and another amazing composer called John Maxwell Geddes. So I, I guess I learned the basics of orchestration, but I'd always... I didn't really know kind of what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to write melodies and music. That was always kind of my thing. But film music always sounded so glamorous and didn't really know anything about it. But while I was there, I started working with a load of bands. Um, Glasgow had a really cool music scene. So there was a studio there called Savas Studios. It was pretty much the only studio in Glasgow. Um, so they would all be recording there. It was bands like Bell and Sebastian and Mogwai and Snow Patrol and Texas and Simple Minds and Horse. And I don't know, just started hanging around with them, I guess. And I hired a little studio around the back of there that I could work from. And then I became known as the string arranger. They'd be like, oh, there's that, there's that classical dude uh, that's you know, was at the RSAMD, the Academy. Um, maybe he'll put some strings on our album. And then I just really enjoyed the pop world. And then this director phoned up and said, hey, I heard some of your arrangements on it was Isabel Campbell's album from Bell and Sebastian. Um, do you fancy doing one of my films? And it was a short film. And then I was like, OK, that's this, this is quite fun doing this whole film music thing. So I've always kind of floated between the two. I've floated between the pop world and and the soundtrack world, I guess. And the more soundtracks you do, the more the bands want to work with you and the more bands you do the more that the soundtrack guys want to work with you so it's this, this bizarre circle but i guess you made the the right choice uh, working on um on feature films and tv series not stuck uh, short films and but besides doing that besides your um or apart from your assignments in the hollywood's film industry you had also been commissioned to write the theme for the u.s olympic team in 2008 i believe that was amazing. Yeah, that was for the Beijing Olympic Games. Yes. And um, I I was flat out on a soundtrack. I was doing this series called Spooks for the BBC. Uh, it's called MI5 in some other countries. But um, And they phoned up and I was like, oh, I'm really busy, I'm really busy. And I didn't really know what it was. They just said, fancy, you know, you know, fancy writing an anthem. Um, so I said no. And then they came back about a month and a half later and said, look, you know, <laughs> we've listened to over a thousand people or something, you know, a load of bands, a load of actual Hollywood composers. And they said, we just think your style is really perfect for it. Would you want? So I ended up doing a track in a couple of hours just as an idea. Like, this is great. We love it. I was like, all right. OK. So I kind of scored it. We flew them over to Glasgow and we recorded the orchestra there and the beautiful halls. And then they flew me out for the premiere of it to Colorado Springs. And I just had absolutely no idea 
the scale of it, I guess. <laughs> and it, <laughs> so I'm out there, and there's about 1,500 people, and they've flown me and my engineer out. And there's a, this massive concert hall in Colorado Springs. And it's surrounded by Olympic gold medalists and the heads of Coke and, and Visa and McDonald's and all of this. I thought, oh, what's going on? <laughs> and they're like, well, you are. <laughs> well, what do you mean I am? They said, well, you're premiering your your, your anthem today. I said, right. And then you're doing a three-hour Q&A with everybody. <laughs> so I say, oh, right, okay. <laughs> so, um, they're like, and you know this is being played to do with the Shanghai, you know, the, uh, the game, sorry, the Beijing games and stuff. I was like, oh, right. Uh, yes, okay. And then, then it kind of dawns on me, the gravity of it. And it was one of the most beautiful things about music, which is that you've got gold medalists coming up to you there going, I get up at 5 a.m. every day to train. And I listen to your music every morning to get me in the mood. It's really aspirational and it's optimistic. And I was like, oh, this is, God, that's an amazing thing. And it suddenly makes you realize you know, that's the power of music. When someone actually gets in touch and says, your music moved me, whether it's from a film, whether it's your own album, whether it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's just the fact that you've got that ability to move someone. So, yeah, so that was pretty cool. And then at the same time, I was doing a track for the launch of the World Trade uh, it was called the Freedom Towers, the World Trade Center that had obviously come down with 9-11. So the launch of that, and then that track got heard by someone. And I don't know, it it just kind of, I like doing lots of different stuff, but it kind of bounces off different things. Because suddenly I was in LA and there I was producing a band. And then I flew back to Glasgow and literally as I got off, this uh, wonderful man who's now uh, my manager, Jim Keller in New York, uh, said, look, I've heard your anthem and i absolutely love it and so on there's a film would love you to pitch on it you know and so i said well what is it and it was this film limitless uh, so i was like well it's christmas and he said yes i know it's christmas but it's a wonderful film and i think you'd be perfect for it so i pitched on it and yeah i i, I got the gig as it were um and that was my first kind of big feature film and it just kind of took off from there i guess i would also love to talk about limitless but first of all i wanted to congratulate you on the um Olympics theme, which of course um, was 12 years ago, but I... Oh, you make me feel old now. Was it 12 yeah, years ago? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was a very good theme and uh, given the historic moments of the Olympic Games, which they have, and the historic moments they have produced for so many years, I think it must have been so difficult to explain press that thematically and also musically and how you created that and you made it sound american but it wasn't too obvious it was really really something really good thank you there's a wonderful so the head of i think it was the head of marketing at the u.s olympic committee john pierce um and again you know going back about music transcending barriers he invited me to his family's house on thanksgiving i've never been to america before and suddenly i'm there kind of you know, going off and sitting there with his family and again you know it's just it's it's a wonderful thing when people take you for what you are and i remember speaking to him and i said well surely there are american composers that are do can do this he said yeah but there's something about the scots he said where i don't know you've just got it in your style and so on and he's i said well what do you want to achieve with this piece and he said well shut your eyes he said yeah you're not writing for a film just shut your eyes and picture the the, the dream of an olympian starting to from whether they're training, as I told you a minute ago, when they're actually listening to it, but they're young and they're training and four years, eight years later, it's that whole aspirational we can do to the moment that you lift up your arms and yes, you know, we've won this. I don't know, it sounds very weird. And he said this lovely thing when I went over for that Q&A at Colorado Springs and he he was asked that by, I can't remember if it was NBC or it was one of the news stations. And you've got banks of, you know, lined up there, banks of photographers and reporters. And he just said, well, sometimes it's only by being on the outside looking in that you can actually see yourself for what you are. And I thought that was a fascinating phrase. You know, instead of an American going, this is what America's about, here's this Scotsman who's looking out and kind of going, well, these are the things that I think are wonderful about America. And I'm going to put that into a piece of music, distill it and see what comes out. And I think your career um, has been very versatile so far and you just mentioned limitless which of course is a totally different ball game a totally different approach than the olympics of course and i must say limitless is a 
very cool movie. And of course you wrote the score for it and you used all these cool and nice electronic elements. And could you perhaps walk me through the process a bit, how you worked on Limitless and how you chose the sound palette which ended up in the picture? Sure. So <laughs> I always say to people, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think sometimes they can't tell if I'm joking or not. It's like, look, I'm a really good composer, but I'm not trained in the same way that... So I started, as I said, at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music. And it wasn't really... It was a film music course, but it wasn't really. It was more about the fundamentals of you know, how you make... Do, do, does an oboe sound good doubled with a horn and a flute and the orchestration side of it? They didn't really teach me... Yeah, this was a while back. They didn't really teach me about the technical aspect of it. I kind of taught all that myself. Whereas you get all these amazing composers nowadays coming out of UCLA or USC or Berkeley or wherever. And technically, they're so proficient. It's scary. But I sometimes feel that what it's lacking is a bit of soul. Yeah, It's like everything sounds fantastic and big production values. But there's no tune in it or there's no melody or there's nothing that makes it stand out from a billion other soundtracks. And I remember when I was doing Limitless, I just finished uh, I, was, I, say, I was working on this band and i was working on i was doing some drum programming for no doubts album um push and shove and there was an amazing producer over here spike uh, mark stent lovely guy um so yes yeah, so i've been working on some synths and had a load of 80 synths and stuff like that and then the chance to say do this um to pitch for this came up and i was like well i've got these really cool sounds from the no doubt album let's you know i've got them all up and it's <laughs> bloody hard to recreate 80s 80 since once you've got the sound up it's like right don't 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 get rid of it you can't save it on your computer so yeah so i use some of those and i just apparently the way that one normally pitches for films is that you go and write certain scenes and they get a bunch of composers going oh this is my take on it or this is my take on it and i didn't do that i just kind of said well look you know, send, send me the scripts and send, send me these scenes anyway so i can have a look at it but i just didn't bother scoring the scenes i just went away and wrote kind of three I guess three, three or four minute tracks that I was inspired to write. I kind of thought, well, this could be cool in that part, or this could be cool in that part. And it turns out it was a good thing to do. They were like, wow, he's totally nailed the vibe of this. They started chopping up my music, putting it into different bits. Going, that's this motif. And yeah, for those of you that haven't watched it, it's about Bradley Cooper, this guy who takes this pill called NZT, which makes him incredibly bright and can do these amazing things in the space of about two seconds. So I'd wanted to write some long themes and I thought it's not going to work for this. So I just came up with this motif, which was this kind of major third, minor third. And as to indicate the fact that when it's major third, he's all there. And as soon as it's minor third, suddenly his mind's going all screwy. And it became this real kind of contrast of stuff. So it was that. And then I recorded some guitars. And again, it's kind of a back to front way of doing it. I recorded some guitars for the demo. And then normally you will then replace those when you go and do an actual soundtrack you'll do a proper recording at the end but i'd chop them up so much it sounded quite daft punky i'd chop them up and detune them and time stretch them and so on and i was like man this sounds really cool and i did record a bunch of guitars at the end but they just didn't sound as good as the original crunched up versions so i kept i kept the original guitars that had been massacred from the original demo and, and kept it in there thank you very much for sharing this story with me and paul as we are a little Pressed for time, I would love to dive right into Tales from the Loop. Very recently, you had collaborated with Philip Glass on the brand new Amazon TV series called Tales from the Loop, as I just mentioned. And if anyone out there is eager to learn more about the series itself and the score, how would you describe the series in terms of story and the music which accompanies it? Tales from the Loop is so unique. It's flip it. It's it's sci-fi, but it's not traditional sci-fi. I find that in traditional sci-fi, it's all about the technology, whereas Tales from the Loop is based on these wonderful drawings by this brilliant artist called Simon Stullenhug, who is a Swedish artist, and it's dystopian. I would say, but it's not post-apocalyptic because you look at these images and they evoke so many feelings. And then this series was 
based on those images, Nathaniel, a fantastic showrunner, wrote these eight stories based on what he was inspired by these pictures. So there is technology in it. There are robots, but it's not really about the robots. It's about human connectivity, I would say, and how people have an effect on each other. Um, there is this weird thing called the Eclipse, which is underground in the loop, the Mercer uh, is it Mercer Institute of Technology, something like that, um, but where they try out different things. And because of this eclipse, this thing that happens underground, which is the sci-fi element of it, certain weird and wacky things happen in the town above. Uh, things might suddenly pause mid-time, or I can't really say that much without kind of giving stuff away, but weird things happen. And in other sci-fi movies, that is what the story is about. It's about the technology and how did it create this and the strangeness of things that happen. Whereas in this, strange things happen, but they just are. There's a robot standing in the field, is the way that I describe it. It, it. Is it very hard to explain? There's a robot. What's he doing? Nothing. He's just sitting there. But the main point of this is that they are eight beautiful films, yes. which work standalone, but they also work as together. You, know, you could watch them as standalones and you wouldn't miss anything. But there is definitely a nice way of kind of watching them together, which interconnects. And it's about, yeah, these tales that happen and the human connectivity of what happens because of these things and the knock-on effect. So something might happen in episode two, which then leads to something happening in episode three. And you don't need to know what happened in episode two to watch episode three, but it helps. So someone someone compared it to Twilight Zone meets Stranger Things meets something or else. I, I don't see the Stranger Things aspect in it at all. <laughs> no, genuinely, and it's, you know, I love Stranger Things, but I don't see that aspect. Whereas Twilight Zone, I can see it because every week one strange thing would happen. So I can see that description of it. But it's just utterly beautiful. The pace of it is so... A lot of things nowadays are so frenetic and so in your face. This is just it's binge watching but i say to people don't binge watch it watch one episode a night because emotionally you're drained after watching these by the end of watching this series it's about life it's about stuff that happens but it's about hope for mankind without getting all arty i genuinely feel at the end of watching these eight so it's one of the most beautiful things that i've ever seen or scored <laughs> um but just yeah it's 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 so unique it's incredible that it's been made and the feedback from people has been one of two things i would say about 95 percent of people have gone this is unbelievable, you know, particularly in lockdown. I can just, it's pure escapism and I'm taken and transported to a completely different world. Yep. Whereas the other 5% are like, it's really slow. <laughs> it's like, yes, that's the beauty of it is that it is slow. It's <laughs> like, but I don't think that's, um, that's an issue at all because the story is, t is told wonderfully and quietly. And the cinematography is just absolutely oh, astounding. It's amazing. That Jeff Cronenworth doing episode one. Yeah, and it's, his stuff's just unreal. Nathaniel, the showrunner, always spoke about uh, Tarkovsky as a, um, and you see those the style and the sensibility. And Mark, uh, director of One, who's just also become a very dear friend now, but he had done One Hour Photo and Never Let Me Go, and I remember seeing Never Let Me Go, thinking this is just again from a style style. Yeah, you know, he's got such a unique style, and people say, oh, he's the pop video director. It's like, no, I mean he is. But you should see his films. His his vision is incredible. It's brilliant. As a composer, or as a team of composers, as you worked with uh, Philip Glass, what do you think was the biggest musical or artistic benefits you could possibly have hoped for when working on this on this project? Do you know, I I came into it, and Mark had wanted to work with Philip. Philip's super busy and has also never done a TV series before. And then I think my name was floated around because I've worked with Errol Morris before. Um, and Errol's is the greatest living documentarian. And he's just such a brilliant filmmaker. And I've done, I think I've done the last four films with him. And Philip has done pretty much every other film before that. And so I think they all just kind of went, well, look, you know, there's obviously something about Paul that Errol sees. Let's go and look at his stuff. And then, he, and then Mark said something along the lines of, hang on, is that Paul Enner Morgan that did Wormwood, which was this series that Errol had done for Netflix a few years ago. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. It's like, God, I love, love that soundtrack. It's amazing. So then it was a case of, right, well, there's Philip, there's Paul. Let's chuck him in the same room, see what happens. And I think from my point of view, I've never really collaborated with another composer before. So I didn't know what I was 
letting myself in for. Philip certainly didn't know what he was letting himself in for working with me. But, um, but as we kind of then went into it, so I said to him, well, how's this going to work? You know, are you doing a bit and I'm doing a bit? Or are you doing some themes and I'm doing some themes? And it was this really organic process in the end where I went to New York. I sat down with him. We chatted away about just music in general. We didn't have any visuals at that stage. So normally you kind of come on and quickly do a pilot is the phrase. You, know, you go in, it's literally two weeks of carnage. This was three months proper collaboration between Philip, me, um, Nathaniel and Mark. And they said, well, we would love some music so that when we're shooting, we've got it in the back of our mind. And yeah, so Philip and I just kind of sat down and Philip came up with this beautiful chord sequence. And I was like, well, we should add a cello to this. This would be great. Put a cello line over the top of it. I was like, well, this is beautiful. This is haunting. This is the Tales from the Loop vibe. And I think what I learned from Philip was that not everything has to have tons and tons of layers. On a lot of the electronica stuff I write or the hybrid stuff I write, you, know, you maybe got 120 parts going on. Philip was like, let's cut all this back. Let's just literally have piano, cello, and see where it evolves from there. And so suddenly the soundtrack stripped right back and it's all about the emotion and the melodies and nathaniel and mark have both said and i've said this before but you know that, that they wanted a timeless soundtrack one that you could have so many melodies like you used to do in the olden days but you don't get a chance to do now and they were like we want people to listen to this soundtrack out with the series and so many people i mean it's been unbelievable the reception that we've had people have just said this is the most sublime score it's the most beautiful thing they have ever heard i've just had it on loop ever since no gag intended you know i've listened to this on loop and some people have just said well listen to this haven't seen tales from the loop but absolutely adore this music so yeah so it, it's it's been an amazing thing but i guess so to answer your question you know, what have i learned from philip about stripping things back when we spoke about the style and the instrumentation then I'm suddenly bouncing ideas off Philip going, well, look, we're trying to come up with an instrument that is so innocent here. It's not about technology. It's about being the most basic instrument. What is there? And we ended up, I played a load of recorders on it. Uh, I, I used to play recorder a lot. Um, so the recorder was one of the main instruments as a little motif. And Philip came up with this little motif and said, well, how about this? I expanded on that motif and started changing it around a bit. And then we had this theme that basically every time something magical is happening, so it's, it's not tons, but every time you get one of three instruments, one is the recorder, and then one is the Egyptian ney, uh, which is just Middle Eastern wind instrument. And the other thing that I then did was made a lithophone, which is basically grabbed a bunch of stones from the garden of different sizes, put some metal tubes underneath them and hit them. Uh, and so they kind of resonated and played just weird weird different pitch sounds and i made a sample kind of library from that and that for us was like well that's fundamentally you know if you're looking at something which has an absence of technology then how could you do that musically and so that was it, it was like hitting things or the recorder or the nay it was these basic instruments that then combine with the beautiful hauntingness of what became a string quartet and a flute and a harp for episode one and two we had a great big orchestra and then we stripped that right back and said it's it's too it's almost too over the top. It worked fantastic for Mark's uh, film, episode one. And then after that, we just kind of wanted something more emotional that really could pull at your heartstrings and have, it's like being in a gig. You know, sometimes you can have a huge band in front of 80,000 people and it's this great vibe. Sometimes it's being an intimate gig, playing in front of 30 people and just having a few people on stage. And that's kind of where we ended up, I think, with the soundtrack. It was this really intimate score. Paul, there are a couple of episodes which really stood out for me, as for me personally. Uh, for instance, episode number three, which is called uh, Stasis, in which the young girl finds a way to, um, to freeze time. Yeah. And she has a great time with her <laughs> quote-unquote boyfriend. <laughs> and I also thought it gave you a great opportunity to score scenes that had no dialogue no sound effects whatsoever and um, could you please tell me a bit about your sentiments uh, for this episode yeah i mean three is a weird one because to begin with everything's normal in the world and then again without too many spoilers yeah time stands still and only two people have are doing anything so the thing about tales in the loop is that there as i said before that there is a touch of melancholy it's quite a lot of melancholy to the music But you get a chance to write these melodies. I was like, well, how do we do this when time has stood still? 
and we uh, yeah, we're not using electronica so it's like how do you create weird sounds we ended up taking a cello and we made we distorted it and put it through 100 percent reverb basically the biggest reverb we could find and so as soon as they're going down that corridor you have this really haunting da, 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 da. it's this weird kind of thing as they go down and then the lither phone comes in and then she's happy and you get a quartet coming as she's twirling her skirt and so on but the ability is you just nailed it to write pieces of music which last for i don't know but i mean Episode seven has 20 minutes with no dialogue, but episode three, you know, one of these cues, I think is six minutes long. It just doesn't happen in movie making anymore. So yeah, so it was that, it was called well, taking that original sound, the cello, then mucking around with it. So as I say, it's got distortion and, and reverb and so on, but it still sounds, you can't tell what it is, but it's definitely not a synth. And then that then evolves into this beautiful quartet, which then goes off as she goes on. But I mean, yeah, they're heartbreaking stories, tells the loop. And you know, the, there's a lot of bittersweetness in it. I think you know, every time you're getting happy, something happens to one of the characters or something happens in the world. So, it, and it's like life, isn't it? There's a lot of happiness. There's a lot of sadness, but at the end of it, the overall feel is, yeah, yeah we'll be all right. And episode, episode four for me was still one that gets me every time. Andrew Stanton, who directed Wally, he's a Pixar director. Um, what he created in episode four is I think, one of the most beautiful bits of television I've ever seen. And it's so powerful. And I cry pretty much every time I watch it. it, it, it I, I don't normally do that when I'm watching things, and particularly not when they're finished. But I'm not finished either. Yeah, we work <laughs> it's just so unbelievably powerful. And it's just a human story. And I won't give it away. Go watch it. And you know, what, watch yeah. it with your nearest and dearest and then phone your mum and dad and tell them that you love them very much. Uh, but it's, yeah, the power of these episodes, they're, they're just, they're like eight films I've never seen before. That's what I said at the start of this interview. It's, it's very hard to describe because I've never seen anything like it. Episode number four is a very good example. I was going to mention it anyway. It's called um, Echosphere. Yeah. And of course, without giving too much away it's a <laughs> so hard isn't it it's really it's really hard and but also very good very good filmmaking and how did you handle the emotional aspect of the story musically of course as we all know human emotion and tragedy are two very complex issues and aspects of everybody's life so to speak and when it comes to your own sensitivities as a musician and as a composer, how would you say you dealt with this on an emotional and personal basis? So episode four is about a boy and his grandfather and basically a getting to know you story, should we say, and things happen between them and some bit sad and some bit happy. So I remember chatting away to Philip about it and we said, well, intellectually, and it's funny, isn't it? Because sometimes you just, go totally emotionally you go i've got a theme for this person or i've got a theme for that with this we were like well intellectually what is it about and it's about fundamentally a boy and his grandfather so the thought for episode four was about a piano duet and it's like well so you have this on one hand this kind of major seventh kind of thing going on do 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 and then there's a scene in the middle of it which has the boy and his grandfather and it's almost like they're two lives coming together um and then so that is like you have the left hand playing all these triplets and the major sevenths and then you have another player on top which is say the grandfather's part who has this counter melody going against it so it starts off with cole looking in wonder at something and then the grandfather joins in and then his melody comes over the top and as the two then join together you then have this string quartet kind of leading the way. And again, it's not a great big Hollywood orchestra. It's a quartet, so it's not overriding it emotionally. And it it leads, I think that, that, that track's called Light in the Dark. And I remember just kind of, it's so intellectually, that is how we were looking at it. It's like the two lives colliding. So that kind of then had a payoff, which is at the end of the episode, again, we give the game away, but <laughs> there's a track called Blink of an Eye, and again, the idea with that was taking elements of that track, taking elements of Cole's theme, taking elements of the grandfather's theme and kind of speeding it up. So it's like, well, now we're going on, we're combining the two lives and we're looking at certain aspects of their lives. They come on and it was just haunting. And when we got to episode eight, that for me 
was fundamentally what the series was about. It was about life um, and our connections with each other. I, I keep going back to it, human c- connections and human connectivity, which is obviously so sorely lacking at the moment in life yeah. um, with lockdown. And you look at that on the larger scheme of things and about life, not just about these months. So then kind of reverted to the blink, blink of an eye track, which is the end of episode four and kind of changed it around and added on a few more instruments to create the series finale, as it were, which kind of wraps it up. And someone had said, I always love it when people analyze the music because they sent a message and said, I, I never realized it, but subliminally, you've just taken us through this series. It starts off with a the theme. The theme comes back. The theme carries on. There's this piano, wonderful chord progression that Philip came up with you know, that, that goes through it. And then you know, the melodies and so on, and they gradually evolve. And then at the end, you're almost back to where you started, which again, without giving the game away of what you've seen. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, 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 it, and I, I love it when people actually notice that because you do these things subliminally and you don't know whether people will pick up on it or not. Uh, and then they do. And yeah, it doesn't matter whether they do or not because it's to help, help the emotion. You're not supposed to override it. But when you've got, this is, say, 20 minutes of episode seven which has no dialogue it's just music it's really nice people have picked up on the importance of it i guess and nathaniel and mark said that all along they've been so supportive from a point of view you want an orchestra you've got an orchestra you want a quartet you've got a quartet and annie the production person she was she she was phenomenal she fought a corner and everybody amazon fox disney they've all just said look this is so unique we brought you guys on board because we want you to do something special with it. And I, I think, and I trust, and hopefully you know, we have, but I would say, you know, you couldn't get to that stage if you weren't given the confidence to go off and try doing something different. And I can't say enough good things about Mark and Nathaniel because yeah, yeah. as a, as far as having that vision for what they wanted that series to be, man, you know, they, they backed us to the hilt. The series, it tells eight individual stories which are not necessarily linked to one another of course we get to see quite a few characters several times and notice oh well there's a character in episode four which was introduced in episode two and so on and so forth but the story isn't told chronologically and i thought it was a very good idea brilliant cinematography the series deals with human emotion with tragedy, with, uh, let's say, peril, with happiness. And to me, that's always the most important part, you know, the story, the characters, the music, the cinematography. And in this case, it blends together really, really well. And it's just a marvelous product, I must say. But I think the thing with that is... All the, I mean, the directing talent that they had on board for all eight episodes is phenomenal. The cinematography talent they had, you know, just everything about, about it is brilliant. But going back to that word collaboration, because a lot of people have said, well, how did you and Philip collaborate? You know, and it's like, and, and that's a story by itself is you, know, the remote collaborations. I see him in New York. I come back to LA. We're sending ideas back and forth. He's sending me manuscript paper. You know, I'm sending him back MP3s. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, that by itself is a phenomenal collaboration. But the thing that has made Tales from the Loop unique has been the collaboration with all aspects of it. The fact that we're writing music before Mark's gone and shot episode one. So he's then going off imagining this music in his background. He's then sending us what we call dailies, the rushes, what he's shot that day. So it's not even Ed. It's just to give us an idea of what's going on there. And then after it's come out, you're then looking at that going. Someone had said, oh, you should. I think they'd added me on Twitter and added Simon and I've got to chat to Simon, uh, the, the artist, uh, on, on Twitter. And he's a funny guy. He's a lovely guy. He's sickeningly talented, but you suddenly realize that when people, so many people have started doing covers of our music and other people have started doing covers of Simon's art you know, or inspired by episode two, they've done their own trailer art for it. And my, yeah, it's amazing when you think that, Art can have such a knock-on effect, and I say art, whether it's music, whether it's visual art, whatever it is, that it can bring people together in a way that I don't think anything else can, and it's, it creates a sense of community. So you collaborate on Tales in the Loop, and then you have other people going, I've been inspired by this, I'm going to go and do a 
cover of your soundtrack and is this right or um, Simon I'm doing a cover of your artwork is this right and it suddenly gets a discussion going and you think oh my god you know it's forget about lockdown it's just a wonderful thing when you have collaborations across the board because that's what art is about in the end congratulations on tales from the loop and i strongly encourage everybody to to watch it it's now out on amazon prime uh, what's actually what's actually next for you so we're finishing up cyberpunk at the moment which is this game that i've been writing with Marcin and piotr in poland um so that is coming out it's supposed to be coming out yesterday and they've, they've pushed it to i think september it's a beast and again going back to kind of hype around things never known anything like it you know Mar Marcin and piotr are just incredible and again that's a it's a conversation for another time but they they brought me on they brought me on board to kind of help them rather than the other way around um they, they the stuff that they've done is just phenomenal and then i've come come along and kind of gone again i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> <I get it. laughs> story of my life it's like this was the thing like i i write good music but i like you know, particularly in games games are such a different beast they've totally held my hand and said right you know, this that melody is great these sounds are great now let's transform it for this game so they've been phenomenal but as i say that you, you come back to me in september and we'll talk about that one uh so yeah so cyberpunk i'm finishing up i'm writing a concerto at the moment which is supposed to be being premiered in august right. um at the intercelltic festival in lorient in Brittany, in france um who knows whether that's they, they seem to think it's still going to be happening so i was like okay well i'm still writing at the moment yeah, so who knows take, yeah Writing concertos takes a little while, so I'm writing that. I've got a new film, Michael Caine, Aubrey Plaza, called Bestsellers. So I've just started that literally this week. Um, there's another film called Conversion, which I'm doing. And there's a film with Nathaniel Kahn, which is uh, middle of this year. So it's pretty busy. Um, Good. But the thing is, like all of this stuff has been shot. Um, so the concerto is obviously different. Um, so who knows what it'll be like later on in the year. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, it's... It's kind of weird because I know a lot of a lot of people as far as people with inverted commas normal job are either working from home or, you know, it's, it's maybe calmed down a little bit because of the horrendousness that's going on. Yeah. Whereas I think for a lot of us media composers, I think we're pretty full on at the moment because we've still got stuff that's been shot. But obviously come around September, October, there'll be nothing left to, to write music for for that. So I think I'll probably probably chill out and around September, I think, and see the kids. Paul, is there anything else on your mind, music-wise, career-wise, which you would like to share with me and our great audience? One thing I would say to do with lockdown, um, and this is my random thought for the day, is I thought you know, composer's life is lonely. You're always in the studio, and then you get to go out to recording sessions. And you suddenly realize that the recording sessions you always knew were so much fun. And that's where the buzz is as a composer. You stand there in front of your orchestra or your quartet or your electric guitar or whoever it is you've got in there but it's that kind of collaboration i go back to that word collaboration you, they play your stuff and you give them and you give them your feedback and i've found we've had to do a lot of remote recording which is where these musicians are doing their recordings in their studios or their living rooms and then sending you their parts and then you load it in there and mix it and i've definitely missed that touch of it but what i've realized is that my god there are a lot of brilliant musicians out there that i've never had two seconds to actually meet as it were And you suddenly realize that, wow, you've got this opportunity to use, I mean, Armenian, did it, whatever, whatever your weird and wacky instruments are or your sitars or whatever, which I probably wouldn't bother using because it's too much effort to get them into the studio to come and do a three hour session. Because by the time you've done that and the setup and takedown has taken six hours of your day and you don't have six hours in a day normally. Whereas the, all this remote recording, I've suddenly realized, man, there are so many people out there that you can just send stuff to. And then while you carry on working, they'll lay down some ideas and then you can muck around with it and hear whether it's going to work or not. And instead of it being this great big deal of six hours of your day, it's taken you or your assistant, whatever, 15 minutes to lay down the track and fire it off to someone. And then it's taken them an hour and then they'll send it back and then you know whether it's working or not. So it's definitely opened up my eyes to the world of online collaboration, I think, a bit more, which, again, so whilst I missed the human contact of these recording sessions, there's good out of it in the sense that I'm becoming aware that when things calm down, I can actually sort of go and start looking into some of these different instruments and getting yeah. back to music research and finding out different sounds, which I've never had a chance to before.
Paul, thank you so very much for taking so much time out of your busy schedule for me. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope you did too. Oh, I've absolutely loved every word of it. It's so nice speaking to someone in a different country who's going through the same thing. And I don't mean that in a schadenfreude way. It's, it's weird. You know, you kind of think you're stuck away and then you realize it is everywhere in the world at the moment. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's nice to take an hour out and chat. It was lovely. I had a great time talking to you and I hope we get to do many more interviews in the future. Totally. Give me a, give me a shout when Cyberpunk's coming out in September. But Michael, it's absolutely lovely chatting with you, man. Same to you, man. Take care. Take care. Bye.